our lecture series, and we are very pleased to have a guest lecturer with us tonight. Uh, it's Dr. Steve Kowaler from Iowa State. Uh, Dr. Kowaler was on the steering committee for the Kepler telescope, which was launched in the beginning of March. <laughs> I thought it was the seventh. It could be the seventh. I thought it was the seventh, but I thought it got delayed today. But it was I mean, late. Uh, and it was successfully launched and is now soaring through space and I just heard the dust cover came up. So uh -oh. it's getting ready to, to do some science. And so with no further ado, I'd like to present Dr. Stephen Kowalik. Can we come the lines down? Yes, we can. Great. Brian was just showing me the, the Parkes telescope in, in the dome over there, the 16-inch. Uh, that's how far we can turn them down. Oh, cool. Can you do it halfway? <laughs> no, because we have red light. Oh, okay. There you go. Great. That's perfect. Say, that's, that's, that's perfect. Um, that telescope is reminiscent of the telescopes that I grew up with, in particular this one. <laughs> uh, for scale, that's me as a 16-year-old. Uh, and that's an 8-inch F9 Newtonian reflector that I built when I was 15. Um, it's a crappy telescope, uh, it's, but I still have it. Uh, it was the first of four that I built by myself. Uh, they all kind of worked, and as you can see, uh, this was a, a bargain basement telescope. The barbells, which I clearly never used, uh, are a terrific counterweight for this telescope. Uh, so that's a scary picture, so let's just take it away. Uh, today I'd like to talk about the telescope that I'm hoping to be using shortly. Uh, which is bigger and farther away and a lot more expensive. Uh, it's a telescope that was designed to look for Earth-like planets around sun-like stars. It's called Kepler. Uh, and so today I'd like to tell you a bit about the story of why Kepler was built, the science that it wanted to do, uh, and a tiny, tiny bit about my, my participation in the project. Uh, so here's uh, this evening's trajectory. Uh, first of all, what do we mean by an Earth-like planet? You probably all know that we know of hundreds of extrasolar planetary systems now. Uh, stars, some like our suns, or some very different from our suns that host planetary systems. Uh, but the planets that we're now looking for are Earth-like planets. And so I'll define what that means. What is a habitable planet? What is a friendly planet for life? Uh, we'll also talk about why it's hard to find planets at all. Uh, it's hard enough to find massive Jupiter-like planets close to their parent stars. Finding Earth-like planets farther away is, is that much more difficult, so I'll go through some of the challenges there. Uh, oops, sorry, let's go back. Uh, we'll talk about the technique that the Kepler satellite will be using uh, to find Earth-like planets, the occultation technique, and I'll give you some demonstrations of why that's such a powerful technique. Then I'll talk a bit about the Kepler mission, the design, the telescope, uh, the deployment, which has so far been going almost like a, the, almost perfectly. And then some conclusions. What do we expect to see, uh, and what's what's going to happen in the future? Minutes, uh, <laughs> time. We'll see. We'll see if I can get that a little bit sooner. All right. So, why did I get interested in, in, in astronomy? We we could go around the room, and the members uh, of the Moyne Astronomical Society can can each give their own reasons why they are enthusiasts about astronomy. Uh, but they'll all sound somewhat the same for those of us of a certain age. We were very young when the U.S. space program was getting started. Uh, we watched the Gemini launches or, or Mercury launches. We all followed breathlessly uh, as we landed on the moon in the Apollo program. And we're all kind of disappointed about what's happened since. Uh, we're not on Mars. Uh, we're not traveling to the stars like Star Trek, a show that we watched when we were kids. Uh, Lost in Space is still a dream, despite the fact that the Jupiter 2 was launched in 1999. The TV show Lost in Space from the 1960s took place in the far distant future, 1999. So our progress to the stars has been a little slow. Um, that said, though, we were all growing up in a very exciting time. Even the younger folks here are still growing up in a very exciting time, uh, where the future looks way more promising than, than the present, uh, and the excitement of one day perhaps traveling to the stars or at least exploring uh, space with enormous space-based instruments is, is, is something that we can look forward to. Uh, the thing driving all this, perhaps, is the quest to see how special our Earth is. Uh, clearly, Earth is, a, is an okay place to live. 
despite the fact that the temperate climates that humans need to live is, uh, incorporates maybe 1% of the, the surface of the Earth, it's still an okay place to, to, to start life and grow, grow up, uh, so to speak. But are there other places like Earth? Are there other life forms either like us or not like us? These are questions that, that we've been worrying about for generations, as many generations as there have been people able to look up at the stars. And most of us just sort of wonder about it but can't do much about it, kind of like the weather. Uh, but in 1959, the search for life beyond Earth took a, a dramatic turn with this paper here. Uh, it's a paper titled Searching for Interstellar Communication by Giuseppe Cocconi and Philip Morrison. Philip Morrison, one of the great physicists of the 20th century, was involved uh, in numerous advances in astrophysics, high energy physics. He was part of the Manhattan Project, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Giuseppe Cocconi was an electrical engineer, physicist, and astronomer. They wrote this paper in Nature in 1959. 1959. This is like ancient history. Where they explored the possibility of finding civilizations beyond Earth using radio technology by actually listening for radio broadcasts from other worlds. Uh, in 1959, the Arecibo Radio Telescope was in the beginning planning stages. They knew that radio technology had advanced su sufficiently over the 40 or 50 years that it had been around that they could listen, that we could listen for an Earth-like civilization around a sun-like star across the galaxy. Uh, there's this uh, last paragraph here that I want to read to you. These are serious scientists, okay? These aren't dreamers who, like, want to build a spaceship in their backyard and go off. These are serious scientists, and they say the following. The reader may seek to consign these speculations wholly to the main domain of science fiction. We submit, rather, that the foregoing line of argument demonstrates that the presence of interstellar signals is entirely consistent with all we now know, and that if signals are present, the means of the detecting them is now at hand. The probability of success is difficult to estimate, but if we never search, the chance of success is zero. Uh, basically, it's the same catchphrase as the lottery. You can't win if you don't play. If you don't look, if you don't use the equipment that you have available to look for life beyond Earth, you'll never find it, because they're probably not coming here. Uh, this paper was extremely influential. It got Frank Drake started in his quest to uh, figure out technically how to accomplish this, this sort of thing. Frank Drake is still involved in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. But one of the things stopping us uh, is that the chances of finding a technical communicating civilization beaming radio broadcast to us at a frequency that we can pick up, at a polarization that we can pick up and so on, is, is tiny. Another way to do it, and the way that we're concentrating on and have been concentrating on for the last few decades, is not to find the radio signals from the intelligent civilization, but to find their home. Uh, as uh, Bill Baruki, the uh, director of the Kepler Project, says, we are looking for ET's home. Uh, that's a hard problem, too, but at least it's a problem that's not thwarted by small numbers, it's just thwarted by some difficult engineering. Uh, Finding planets around other stars is a hard problem. Uh, for example, Jupiter, bright planet, second brightest planet in the sky. Planet. You would think that uh, well, that would be detectable with the Hubble Space Telescope, let's say, around the sun from far away. But in fact, no. Uh, Jupiter and the sun. Jupiter is about 500 million times fainter than the sun viewed from far away. 500 million times fainter. Uh, viewed from 30 light years away, a typical kind of distance where the sun would be as bright as a star in the handle of the Big Dipper, oh, I'm sorry, in the handle of the Little Dipper, for example, separated by five arc seconds. You're looking for something that's 500 million times fainter than a star five arc seconds away. Uh, perfect optics are required, no atmosphere is required, an extremely difficult thing to do. Uh, here's the equivalent. One candle viewed 10 feet away from a bank of stadium lights uh, you need to detect that candle in the glare of those fading lights from 80 miles away. That's the kind of problem that we're facing. So it looks something like this. A candle, a very big candle, the size of my hand, <coughs> next to one Musco light. Well, actually next to a bank of Musco lights, and now you can see the candle right there. And you're going to try and see that embedded in a stadium about 80 miles away. Now, Sec Taylor Stadium isn't 80 miles away, but it's probably hard enough to see from 30 miles away. Or how? We're about 30 miles away. <coughs> 400 feet. No, about 20 miles away. 20 miles. Away? Okay, still uh, find a candle in the outfield from here with, with a telescope. I don't care how good your telescope is. It's gonna be fine. Uh, 
can see that cigarette. <laughs> so there are other ways to find planets. Uh, here's one example. Using reflex orbital motion. Many of you have seen the hammer throw in the Olympics. Just watch how he vibrates back and forth as he tosses the hammer. And that fat guy gets out of the way. <laughs> It's a beautiful event, one of my favorite events in, in track and field. But you could see, the, this is a 200-pound athlete with a maybe a 15-pound ball at the end of a chain. As he was swinging it around, he was sort of wobbling a little bit. That's the kind of influence that planets could have on stars. The planet and star orbit their common center of mass. They're swinging around each other. And even if you can't see the planet, you might be able to see the wobble of the star. So it's indirect techniques like that that we use to find planets around the stars. Here's what that would look like. This is a, 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 an animation done by Rick Bogey at uh, Ohio State. And it's a binary star in this example uh, with a mass ratio of about 4 to 1. And you can see that they orbit the common center of mass. But the star, the thing that we can see easily, is moving, in this case, in the plane on the screen. If you were looking up this way, you would be seeing, seeing it oscillating towards you and away from you. That's the kind of motion that you can look for to try and find planets around other stuff. Uh, how do you actually measure that, that motion? Uh, clearly the star is moving one or two stellar diameters. You're not going to be able to see that wobble. It's going to be a few millionths of an arc second or thousands of an arc second. But what you can see is the velocity of the star changing. And you do that by looking at the spectrum of the star. What you see are these lines where there's not much light caused by absorption by uh, atoms in the atmosphere of those stars. As the star moves towards you, the lines shift to the blue. As the star moves away from you, the line shift to the red. The amount of the shift depends on how fast the star is going. It's the Doppler effect. Uh, you've all heard the Doppler effect, right? When a train is coming by, blaring its whistle, you hear high pitch, low pitch as it passes. When it's coming towards you, it's a high pitch. Away from you, it's a low pitch. In Ames, we don't hear that anymore because they've installed the train whistles right at the intersections and it's a remote control from the train, so the train doesn't blow its whistle and you're sitting there. You don't hear the of the train whistle and so you don't know which way the train is coming from. It's very dangerous. Anyhow, uh, same effect uh, in light allows us to measure the wobbles of stars as they move around the center of mass of the star planet system. It's still hard. It's still a small effect. The size of the effect uh, is about well, one part in 10 million, let's say. So these lines are shifting by one part in 10 million as a star like the sun goes around the center of the mass of a sun-Jupiter type system. That's a very small amount to measure. It's 30 meters per second. Okay, 30 meters per second is a little bit faster than the fastest sprinters. Uh, you can ride your bike that fast, maybe. Uh, but still, it's small compared to the speed of light, which is the basis of, of the, uh, the comparison. Nevertheless, if you build a spectrograph that could measure the positions of these lines precisely enough, you can measure to a meter per second or so, and therefore reveal the motions, the wobbles of stars, as they go around the center of mass of the planetary systems. Uh, these systems that were able to do this were developed in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, people then started to look for Jupiter-like planets. Uh, with orbital periods of 12 years or so, 11 years, long periods, down to about a year. They weren't finding it. What they were seeing, though, was that the measurements of the velocities seemed worse than they should be. That is, they could measure the velocities of the planets to a meter per second or so, but they saw a scatter of 10, 20, or 30 meters per second. Couldn't figure that out. Why are the stars not behaving so well? The answer finally came uh, when two very clever astronomers, Didier Kelo and uh, uh, Michel Mayor, uh, decided to take the data from 51 peg. I'm sorry to blast your eyes like this. <coughs> Try not to do that too many more times. And what they did was, instead of looking for an orbit with a period of months, they looked at each individual measurement to see how precise it was and plotted them as a function of time. And here's what they found. Each of these dots has a size that's three or four meters per second thick. This is the velocity here and time here. And they found that indeed there was a wobble in the velocity of 51 peg, but it had a period of 4.2 days, not several months or several <coughs> years. They were able to calculate the mass from the orbital period, 
uh, of the object causing the wobble of that star it turns out to be about half of Jupiter mass. So they had discovered the first planet around a sun-like star beyond the sun. It was nothing like any planet we'd ever seen or thought could exist in the galaxy. A Jupiter mass planet in a, with an orbital period of only four and a half days, or four and a quarter days. Mercury's period is 88 days, so you get a sense that this planet has to be very, very close to its second star. Once uh, Mayer and Kello announced this, though, people went back and looked at the data that they were taking uh, and found a host of other, what we call now, hot Jupiters. Jupiter mass planets very close to their parent stars. This was just an extraordinary result. I was uh, on leave in England when this came out uh, at the Institute for Astronomy in Cambridge. And when it came out, it was in October. Uh, there's a tea every day where all the astronomers gather, and this result obviously was the major topic of discussion. And about 60 of us all decided that there was some mistake. This couldn't be. Uh, maybe it was a binary star that was viewed almost face on, uh, and that could make it look like something like this. Uh, but since other people have been observing 51 Pe, uh, within two or three days the, the discovery had been confirmed with archival data, and we all had to just suck up to the fact that we don't know how planets form, because it's really hard to make a Jupiter mass planet that close to its parent star. Anyhow, uh, in the intervening uh, 14 years or so, uh, a lot more systems have been found. And this is the first uh, 156 extrasolar planetary systems that have been discovered with this radial velocity technique, this Doppler effect technique. Uh, what's plotted here? Well, you can't read the individual names of the systems here, but each of these yellow dots represents the position of the star in the system. Each of the green dots represents the position of the planet in the system. So, for example, this system here has a planet here and a planet there. Uh, our solar system for scale is down here. Mercury, Venus, the Earth, Mars, Jupiter. And you can see all of these systems with massive planets well within uh, where the Earth's orbit would be around those stars. Uh, most have been found by Jeff Marcy and Paul Butler and friends, the guys that figured out after uh, Mayor and Kilo showed them uh, that you can have short period planets. And they have, the number is up around 380 now of extrasolar planetary systems. Uh, a few of these are multiple planet systems that look remarkably like our own solar system. That is, planets inside an orbit like the Earth's, outside the orbit like the Earth's. But in all cases, the planets have a mass of Jupiter's mass, maybe half of Jupiter's mass, maybe twice, three times, five times Jupiter's mass, none with an Earth mass planet. So, where does that leave us? This technique can't find an Earth mass planet. The wobble caused by the star, or caused by the planet on the star, would be a few centimeters per second, so 100 times smaller than the kind of uh, wobbles that you see for Jupiter. But we want to find Earth-like planets. We want to find planets that might have life on them. It's really hard to develop life on a Ju Jupiter-mass planet because most of the mass of a Jupiter-mass planet is its hydrogen atmosphere. And it's real hard to uh, raise a family in the middle of the air. Uh, so what you want is a rocky, solid planet in an orbit such that the temperature of the planet is good is nice, is like today. Uh, <clears throat> warm enough that liquid water can exist on the surface, but not so hot that the sunlight boils away the water. So this is what we call the habitable zone around the star. The, the orbits that place the planet far enough away from the star that water can stay liquid, but not freeze. Okay, And so in this <coughs> Example of our solar system, the Earth's orbit lies within the habitable zone. It's on the inner edge of the habitable zone. The closer you get to the star, the hotter it is. If the Earth was where Venus is, for example, it would be too hot. Liquid water couldn't exist on the surface. It would all evaporate away. Uh, you'd end up with a runaway greenhouse effect similar to what you see on Venus itself. Uh, beyond the Earth's orbit, it's still OK. Until you get close to the orbit of Mars, when then you're too far away from the sun, the sunlight isn't strong enough to keep the water from uh, freezing, and you have permanent ice. Uh, so the nice region that's colored in, in, a, in a very comfortable looking green color here is what we call the habitable zone. Orbital periods of about one year around the solar mass star, a little bit shorter to about two years or maybe a little less. So that's the key, in, one of the key ingredients is the habitable zone around the star. You want an orbital period such that the planet is far enough away from the star that the water doesn't boil away, but not so far away that it doesn't freeze. 
There's another uh, thing to consider, and that is different stars have different size habitable zones, right? A sun-like star has a habitable zone with this kind of an extent. If the sun was cooler, you'd have to get closer to the sun in order to be warm enough to melt the water. And so the habitable zone moves in towards the star. More massive stars, hotter stars have habitable zones that are farther out. So you can figure out where the habitable zone is around the star. All you need to know is the star's temperature. Okay, we're going to get, go bright again here. So, so being in the right orbit is important. You've got to be in the right place. Uh, but you also need to be the right size. Not too big, not too small. Uh, if your planet is too small, if the planet in the habitable zone is too small, then you can hold on to the internal heat of the planet. That is, the planet eventually freezes. That ends tectonic activity. And tectonic activity turns out to be important for recycling carbon between the atmosphere and the ground. Uh, carbon is entrained in the atmosphere through the oceans as well as through land, but that land is eventually recycled through plate tectonics, uh, and the carbon is released again in the form of volcanic activity. Uh, in order for that to work, in order for carbon to be recycled, you need a planet that's about a half the mass of the Earth or more, big enough to hold on to its heat for billions of years and allow plate tectonics to continue. But if the planet is too big, about 10 Earth masses or so, then its gravity is strong enough to hold on to hydrogen and you'll grow rapidly to produce a Jupiter-like planet. And so for an Earth-like planet in a, in a habitable zone orbit, you need to be at the right distance and the mass of the planet has to be the right mass, somewhere between a half and ten Earth masses. So to summarize, the kinds of planets that we're looking for are, first of all, orbiting solar-type stars in the habitable zone with orbital periods of a half to two years with planets that are the right size, about uh, 0.05 to about 0.2 times Jupiter's mass, or about 0.5 uh, to maybe 10 or so uh, Earth masses, a little bit less. That's tiny. 20% of Jupiter, 5% of Jupiter means that the influence of the planet on the star is minimal. And you can't find planets like that with the spectroscopic technique, not with today's precision planning. So, What's a way to find Earth-like planets? How can you find them if this doesn't work? Uh, and that's the transit technique or the transit method. This is what Kepler will use. It will look for brightness changes in the star caused by the planet crossing between us and the star. Okay, it'll block some of the light from the star, uh, causing a dip in the brightness, which will then betray its presence. The time between the dips will be the orbital period. The depth of the dip tells you the size of the planet. The bigger the planet, the more the star falls. And so you'll be able to measure the orbital periods of these planets as well as the size of the planets through this transit map. Here's an example of a transit. This is a picture of the sun I took in my backyard a while ago. Uh, and we will do a little animation with Jupiter crossing in front of, his, of the sun. Here it comes. Let's bring it back so you can see it to the right size. About 1% of the, of the surface of the sun is blotted out by Jupiter if you're looking at the sun from far away, right in Jupiter's orbital plane. This is a nice big effect. You, most of you have seen a transit of Mercury. Some of you may have been lucky enough to see the transit of Venus. And unlike me, found a place where there were no clouds. Uh, there's another one coming in a couple of years. Uh, a transit like this observed from the Earth is really spectacular because you can resolve the Sun and see the, the profile of Mercury or Venus. Uh, if you can't resolve the star, then all you see is the brightness of the star going down. And what you would find is something that looks like this. Uh, so this is now the depth in hundreds of parts per million. So this is 1% drop in the light. Uh, and Jupiter crossing in front of the Sun causes the brightness to drop as Jupiter crosses into the disk of the Sun and then it drop, jump up again as Jupiter leaves and passes the other side of the sun. The time it takes for a Jupiter transit is about 26 hours, oh, well, almost 30 hours. So that's at Jupiter's orbit, at Jupiter's speed, a 26 hour, or sorry, 29 hour transit. But we've seen things like this. 1% drop in brightness is easy. Uh, this is a trace of HD 209458, and you can see its brightness dropped and then jumped up again. It didn't take that long, however. It didn't take 29 hours, it only took about two hours. 
The reason being, this is another hot Jupiter system. The, the orbital period, three and a half days. And so you see this transit every three and a half days. Uh, one or two percent photometry is all you need. That's relatively easy to do with a basic CCD camera and a 10 inch telescope. Uh, this was the first one to be found. There are now about 15 planets that have been found through the transit technique. All are Jupiter sized planets around solar type stars. Uh, here's another view of that, that light curve over several different transits, and this is what it looks like with the Hubble Space Telescope. With the Hubble Space Telescope, you can see that the uh, signal is, is very, very big uh, and very large uh, amplitude. Now, what about an Earth like planet? That's 1% photometry. If you did one tenth of 1% photometry, you'd be doing as well as you can do from anywhere, anywhere on Earth. Is that enough to do an Earth-like planet? Well, let's do the same, same game here. Here's another picture of the sun. And watch carefully for the Earth crossing. <laughs> let's, let's bring it back again. Yeah, it's really small. Uh, now you get a sense of the, the magnitude of the problem here. Uh, the Earth is one-tenth the size of Jupiter, which means it's one one-hundredth the area of Jupiter. It blocks one one-hundredth as much light from its from the sun as Jupiter would. So here's what the transit of an Earth-like planet looks like on the same scale. Now you're beginning to see why doing this from the ground, even with a big telescope at a good site, is, is hard. Uh, let's multiply that Earth's signature by 10, or by 30, or by 100. The signature of an Earth-like planet crossing parent star is 100 times smaller than the kinds of signal that we've seen so far in transiting time. To get that level of precision <coughs> from the ground is really tough. Uh, you need to be able to measure to a few parts per million the brightness of the stars. The entire depth of an Earth-like transit is 80 parts per million. Now, these lights here are pretty good, pretty steady. They're flickering, though. You can't detect the flickering, thank goodness. Uh, it's flickering at about, uh, I measured some incandescent, these are incandescent, right? I measured them at home, they flicker by about one to two percent. Okay, so the, these lights flicker at about the, the level that the Jupiter transit drops the light of the sun. Imagine trying to detect one one hundredth of that flicker in an object hundred light years away. Uh, that level of precision is not, you can't do that from the ground. If you go outside and if it's clear, you'll see the stars twinkle. There's a natural inability of our atmosphere to allow us to see variations on that little tiny, tiny level. And trust me, I've tried this. Uh, my research focuses on looking at tiny brightness variations of stars, periodic variations, uh, to do astro-seismology. So variable stars, but at levels of one part per thousand. And that requires a, a, a mobilization of telescopes around the world to do. Now we're trying to do uh, a factor of 10 to 100 higher precision to find our black planets. So in principle, this works just great in blind planets, but in practice, you can't do it from the Earth. And that's why Bill Baruki, 20 years ago, uh, started to try and sell NASA on a mission to measure the brightness of stars in space at a precision of a few parts per million to try and find Earth-like planets through the occultation technique. He called it Kepler. It's still called Kepler. Uh, the story of Kepler is a long uh, and wonderful story of politics uh, and perseverance. Uh, Bill Baruki, the guy you'll see on TV announcing the discovery of the first Earth-like planet about three years from now, uh, dreamt this up in the 1980s. He knew that technologically speaking it was probably impossible, but he knew that he needed to start work on it. So he tried to get NASA to fund a concept mission. Uh, they refused. He kept working, kept plugging, asked, refused, asked, refused six times over 15 years before it was finally approved uh, in about 2000. This, 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 this mild-mannered scientist uh, is one of the most uh, hard-nosed people you'd want to meet. He eventually did sell it to NASA. Uh, and NASA began to work with Kepler, uh, or will work with Ruki to build Kepler in, in 2001. Uh, by that time, uh, digital cameras were starting to be developed commercially as well as uh, scientifically. Uh, and their precision was high enough, their reliability was great enough that NASA agreed that the technology was ready to build something like Kepler. So we're going to get bright again, okay, so watch your eyes. Uh, what is Kepler? Kepler is optimized for finding habitable planets, planets with sizes between 0.5 and 10 Earth masses, in the habitable zone of their stars. 
that is with orbital periods of between a half and two years. Now, if we knew which stars had Earth-like planets, we wouldn't need to spend the $600 million that it's costing to put Kepler up in the first place. We don't know which stars have Earth-like planets. The question that Kepler is trying to answer is how many stars have Earth-like planets? What is the chance of finding such things? And so it could be a very small fraction. It could be a very large fraction, but in order to get the statistics to measure that fraction, you need to look at a lot of stars. Reasons being, even if all stars had an Earth-like planet around them, the orbits aren't necessarily aligned so that you see a transit. And so you need to look at about 100 stars for every star that you expect to see a transit. Uh, and that's because of the random orientation of the orbits. So the way you can get a statistically significant, a meaningful number of stars is you need to look at 100,000 stars uh, to find about 100 uh, Earth-like planets around them, which is the number you expect if almost all stars have Earth-like planets in uh, Earth-like orbit. So you don't know which stars there are. They are a priori. You have to look at a bunch. Uh, my dad was in retail for 40 years, and he sold some things really cheap, and I knew that he would make it up in volume. Uh, and the chances of, of success are slim, but Kepler will make up for it in volume by looking at a lot of stars. It will stare at 170,000 main sequence stars in a 100 square degree field of view near Cygnus. And it will stare at them, taking an exposure every minute for three and a half years. That's a lot of pictures of a lot of stars. Uh, each measurement needs to be precise to the level of a few parts per 10,000. Taken together, that gets you down to your parts per million precision. Uh, <coughs> now, you want to point at the same part of the sky for three and a half years, which means that you can't do this, obviously, from Earth. You can't do it from Earth orbit, because the Earth goes around the sun and gets in the way as the satellite goes around the Earth. So the only way to do that is to take this satellite and throw it away. And in fact, it will be in an orbit around the sun, not around the Earth. It is in an orbit around the sun, not around the Earth. The Earth is receding from it. It's about two and a half million miles away now. Uh, by the end of the mission, it will be almost 100 million miles away. So here's the field of view. Uh, if it was clear, uh, late at night, you might see this. This is the summer Milky Way. Uh, you might recognize uh, Deneb, Vega, and Alpha, the summer triangle. Uh, here's <coughs> Cygnus, Lyra, M57 is right in there. Uh, Volpecula, one of my favorite constellations, is down here. Uh, where is the field of view of Kepler? This is a big swamp of the summer sky, and there is Kepler's field of view. It's an enormous piece of sky. Uh, again, 100 square degrees. Just to give you a sense of what fraction of the galaxy it's looking at, it can find stars, or it can use stars usefully, uh, out to a distance of about uh, 1,000 parsecs, or 2,000 light years. And so this is the sort of discovery cone here, uh, within which the stars that, that Kepler can measure sit. And here it is uh, to scale in the galaxy. So it's a not huge fraction of the galaxy, but it's still a lot of stars. And it's concentrated in, along this spiral arm of the galaxy, so all of these stars will be in roughly a similar galactic environment as our sun. Uh, it really will answer the question, all else being equal, what are the chances that stars have planets like the Earth? The spacecraft itself uh, looks like this. Uh, I'll show you lots more pictures of it, but just to give you a sense of scale, here's the Earth. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's enormous. Uh, it's about the size of, a, of like a Honda Odyssey van. And it looks kind of like it. I tried to get our van painted like this, but my wife would have none of it. <laughs> Here's a cutaway diagram. Uh, it's a Schmidt telescope uh, with about a one meter clear aperture. Uh, the main mirror is down here. The Schmidt corrector sits over here. The camera sits at prime focus. Uh, I'm, yeah, the camera sits sitting at prime focus here. It's a big camera. We'll look at a picture of it in a minute. Uh, basically, it's a wide field Schmidt camera floating in space. Uh, it is, not will be, the ninth largest Schmidt telescope ever built. And it's the farthest Schmidt telescope from uh, here's some aliens looking at the mirror, trying to figure out why we sent it to them. Uh, this is the corrector, uh, exquisite optics. Uh, this is now the telescope assembly. 
uh, and again, you can see now the scale. This is the, what's called the photometer. All we're doing is measuring the brightnesses of stars. It's a photometer. It's not taking images. It's only sending back the brightness of each of, of the stars in the focal plane. And so it's, this is the photometer on top. The spacecraft bus here, which is responsible for this, the communications with the Earth and guidance and pointing and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and this uh, fellow here is looking at the solar collectors and sun shield. Uh, this, the telescope is kept cold. That's the way CCDs work best. And it's shielded by this thing here, which on the far side has solar panels to provide electricity. So it's a green telescope. Uh, here's another view of the telescope and the dust dust cap on top. More about that later. And finally, here it is all put together on the, left, on the right. The focal plane, the place, the, the business end, the instrument, uh, has the largest CCD camera that's ever been flown in space and what might be the largest CCD camera that will ever uh, be flown in space. It's got 42 CCDs, 21 pairs of CCDs. There you can see a, a, a human hand uh, to scale of one pair of CCDs. Uh, 22 by 1024, uh, thin back illuminated, so the kinds that you use for astronomy that are highly sensitive to blue light. Uh, more details about them than you care to know. Uh, note that it's undersampled, though. Each pixel is 3.98 or 4 arc seconds on a sky, whereas diffraction limited, uh, you're at about a, a little bit less than a tenth of an arc second for a telescope with this clear aperture. That's okay. It's not an imaging detector, it's a photometric detector, so you actually do want to understand it. Uh, it's made by a company called E2D. Uh, just to give you a sense again of, of the scale of this camera, uh, a good digital camera now is maybe a 10 or a 12 megapixel <coughs> camera. This is a 96 megapixel camera. There's a, a view of one of the 42 detectors with a very serious looking technician behind <laughs> And here is the whole array put together, uh, ready for flight. It's, this, it's a foot square. It's a, sort of a dinner tray kind of thing. Uh, notice it's curved, OK? A Schmidt camera. Anybody here ever use a Schmidt camera with film? Right? You have to, to put the film in this, on this holder that sort of bent the film around, so curved. Same, same deal here. Uh, the detector has to be bent to, to, because the field itself, the, the focal plane, is not flat. Uh, just an extraordinary uh, to actually build this thing. We'll see if it works. I, I'm sure it will. Anyhow, uh, so you can see each of these 21 pairs uh, with a space in between, uh, the two on each pair, and a bigger space between each of the, the other pairs. And that's why the focal plane mapped on the sky looks so weird. Uh, this is, again, where the uh, actual silicon is on the sky. So it's not looking at all stars in that 100 square degree thing, but it's looking at stars on which there's a detector. One of my favorite targets that I was hoping they would look at falls right in between two, two of the uh, CCDs. And once pointed, Kepler will not move. And so my hope is they'll miss point by a tenth of an arc second. <laughs> All right, so here's what the, uh, well, the orbit looks like. It's kind of an unusual orbit. Again, you want to stay away from the Earth. Uh, the Earth is a source of light pollution. Uh, it's also a source of radiation. It's a source of blocking light from the stars. It's a terrible place. Uh, well, I, I love it. I, live, I wouldn't live in on any other planet. But if you want to do precise photometry, you want to get as far away from the Earth as possible. So it's in a sun-centered uh, Earth-trailing orbit, as it's called. Uh, it orbits with a period of about 370 days. And so every year it's five days farther behind the Earth. It's going to operate, we hope, for a total of six years. So that's one month and one twelfth of the Earth's orbit behind by the end of the, uh, end of the day. Uh, if you look at the position of Kepler with respect to the Earth as a function of time, so the Earth's sun line being held fixed, Kepler sort of does this loopy thing away because it's an elliptical orbit. Semi-major axis is bigger than the Earth's orbit, but it takes it in and out of the Earth over it all together. And so each of these loops, it does kind of a retrograde loop each year, right? So at the end of year one, two, three, and then four. Uh, we need to run it for three years. Anybody want to know why? Or anybody can guess why? Why do we need a minimum of three years for success? A minute or two. A minute, you take a minute. 
I calculate add it all up, and then take that long. Mm -hmm. Well, in a minute, you need uh, three years to get the, the, the noise quality that you need. But, but we're looking for Earth-like planets. We're detecting them by simple a simple dip in the brightness of the star that lasts 13 hours. If we see one dip, we have no proof that it's in an Earth-like world. We don't know the mass of the star. We don't know the size of the planet. Uh, one year later, if we see another dip, then maybe those two dips are separated by one full orbit. Right? So you discover the planet. A year later, you see a second dip. How do you know that that's the right period that wasn't just some weird fluctuation in the star? You have to wait for a third dip. If the third dip comes exactly the same time after the second dip, as the second dip did after the first dip, then you've got three equally spaced dips in the star. You can be pretty sure you've got a planet. Right? That's only two years, right? You discover, then one year, then two years. No astronomer in his or her right mind is going to claim an Earth-like planet with just the minimum amount of data. And Bill Baruki is a very careful astronomer. He's going to wait a third year. So you get four dips, where the spacing between each of the dips is the same. So you will hear no announcement of an Earth-like planet around a sun-like star for three years after the first dip is seen in that star. Just to be safe and careful and make sure that, that, that the, the telescope has discovered what, what we're hoping to see. Anyhow, so that's why it's in an orbit like this and why we need to keep it alive for at least three and a half. Uh, this is the launch vehicle to Delta II uh, embedded in the nose cone was Kepler. And here you can see it sitting within its launch ground. Here's a view, uh, an expand, I've been instructed by NASA to call this an expanded view, not an exploded view. <laughs> <laughs> an expanded view of the Titan, uh, I'm sorry, the Delta with all of the parts. It's got uh, solid rocket boosters around the outside that are ignited at launch. All but two of them drop away a minute after launch in the, in the air, two more are ignited. You'll see that in the movie in a sec. Uh, first stage is quite big. Uh, the second stage is really small, uh, it's right here, and the third stage is what places it in the final orbit, and this is Kepler sitting at the top. This is the kind of data we're hoping to see uh, from Kepler. Uh, this is data from the Sun at a precision of a few parts per million. This is actual data from a European satellite that's doing sort of the same thing as Kepler is, but only on a handful of stars instead of 170,000. And you can see very high precision measurements. This actually has a giant, giant transiting planet that's producing these transits here. Uh, everything else you see is noise from the star. Star spots, granulation, flares. We'll see it all in the time series from these stars. And distinguishing a transit from all of that other stuff is where the hard work comes from. So what's ISU doing? Uh, as far as participating. Brian mentioned I'm on the uh, a steering committee. It's actually a, a small steering committee within a large collaboration within the whole Kepler uh, project. There's going to be a lot more science coming out of Kepler than just, just, than our flying planet. As big and as exciting as that science is, monitoring stars at a level of precision up to 100 times better than we've ever, mon ever monitored any star before means that you can do a whole lot of variable star science. Uh, a whole lot of stellar activity science. Uh, and the Kepler science team is trying to take advantage of all of this data because, after all, there are going to be 100 or 5 planets found. What about the other 169,900 stuff? Uh, surely we can get something useful out of those as well, and indeed we will. Uh, I'm involved with the Kepler Astro Seismic Seismicast. <laughs> uh, what we're doing is looking for subtle vibrations in the stars, periodic variations at the level of a few parts per million up to parts per hundred, and trying to use those to deduce what's going on in the inside of the stars. Uh, since I was involved with something called the Whole Earth Telescope that did this from the ground, I've gotten involved here. I'm the head of one of the working groups that's going to be looking at oscillating white dwarf stars and some dwarf few stars. Uh, the task is about 250 participants. It's the most international of all of the consortia involved with Kepler data. We were used to working together. We've, this, this large group has worked together on a number of other campaigns. And that's the group that I'm uh, part of the steering committee for. Uh, we have been given 2,000 targets to look at within the Kepler field, plus all of the stars that have planets, because we're going to be using these astro seismic tools to measure the sizes of the stars 
and the size of the stars plus the transit timing gives us the, uh, the period, or rather the velocity of the, of the planet. I'm also involved in the Kepler Guest Observing Program uh, with some colleagues. We're going to be looking at white dwarfs of the Kepler field to see if they have asteroids. Right? The way Kepler works is it looks for an Earth-like planet around a sun-like star. The same relative sizes are asteroids, which are 100 times smaller than the Earth, to white dwarfs, which are 100 times smaller than the sun. So we will be sensitive to finding asteroids by the transit technique around white dwarf stars. Uh, we'll see how that goes. There should be a lot more asteroids around white dwarfs as the remnants of their planetary systems, so we don't have to look at as many of them. Uh, and we'll see if that's successful or not. So what are the expected results? Uh, if all dwarf stars, if all main sequence stars have planets, and we monitor at the end of the day 100,000 stars for, for four years, then we expect about 50 transits of terrestrial planets if most have the size of the Earth. Uh, if most are bigger than the Earth, then we expect to see about 185 Earth-like planets in the habitable zones around those stars. If they're even bigger, if the masses are at the upper limit for the masses of terrestrial or of, of Earth-like planets, then we could have 600, 650 terrestrial planets found around other stars, if all stars have Earth-like planets. And that's what we're going to be trying to answer. So do, all, do all stars have Earth-like planets? Do any stars have Earth-like planets? Uh, if they have orbits that are smaller than the Earth, we'll see lots more. Closer to the star means it's more likely that we'll see a transit in the first place. Uh, we'll be able to do all sorts of other science. But, and this is a point I want to make, we, we should see this stuff. If we don't see this stuff, that's as important to result. If we find no Earth-like planets around other stars, we'll have looked at enough stars to say statistically that the Earth is really a very rare kind of thing. We expect, given everything we know about how planetary systems form, even though we couldn't predict uh, hot Jupiters, but we think we know how planetary systems form. We think Earth-like planets should be fairly common. Kepler will tell us whether we're right, and more importantly, it will tell us if we're wrong. And that's the way to do science, is you come up with an idea and you test it in an in objective way. This is an objective way of testing how common Earth-like planets are. So where are we in the mission? Uh, launch was on March 6th, it says here, <laughs> at 10.49 p.m., uh, and that should be 9.49 p.m. Iowa time because it's 10.49 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, you can see all of the preparations from 2001 selection through launch. Uh, science operations are beginning shortly, uh, now that the, the lid has been blown up. Uh, more about that in a second. Um, the, most hair-raising event so far was the transfer of the telescope from uh, Ball Aerospace uh, to the Kennedy Space Center and being hoisted up onto the Delta II. And this is uh, some pictures of that event. You can see it's wrapped in plastic so you don't have to wear your clean suit anymore. Put on a, a little go-kart and driven uh, to the site where the rocket is. Uh, this is the, the launch fairing, which failed on the Carbon Observatory a week and a half before Kepler was launched which resulted in one day delay as we check, or as they check the, the launch bearing to make sure it would come off. Uh, here it is being transported on the back of a flatbed truck to, to the Delta itself. Uh, oversized load. <laughs> if you take a Honda Civic, wrap it in plastic and put it vertically, it has to go on a white truck. Uh, Bill Baruki, the guy that, that built this thing, was present for all of this, and I can only imagine how he felt uh, when he saw his $600 million spacecraft hanging from a chain being hoisted up to the top of a Delta II. He must have been elated and frightened at the same time. Uh, once it was up there in the, uh, the white room, as they call it, uh, the launch bearing was, was rechecked, closed and sealed. Um, these are the last two human beings to, that we'll ever see coming, unless it's retrieved in the distant future at the Smithsonian. Uh, here it is on the launch pad. Uh, again, a Delta II. Uh, the launch was at night. It was an absolutely gorgeous night. Uh, I actually got to go see, see the launch, which was kind of fun. Uh, I didn't see it from that close, though. <laughs> we saw it from Jetty Park, uh, not Jetty Park. I don't remember the name of the park now, but we were about five or six miles away from the launch site. And you can see it in the distance with floodlights, and this is just a crowd of people uh, waiting for the launch. This guy in red here is Bill Baruki, the guy that, again, is responsible for Kepler happening. 
this is an image of the launch. Uh, ben Cooper, you can find this website. It's uh, launchphotography.com. Ben Cooper does some magnificent imaging of launches of space shuttles, deltas, and all these sorts of things. And this is his image of the launch of Kevin. And I have a uh, video of the launch, too, that I'll play at least part of for you. In case you didn't see it on this. launch enabled to flight. Flight. ATC-3, main power disable on. On. No, the rocket isn't saying that. It looks like we're the slow thing. 30 seconds. T-minus 30 seconds in counting. This is kind of the view we had from Wait, with binoculars from really far away. Wait, uh, green board here in the Mission Director Center. T-minus 15 seconds. T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. Engine, engine start, 1, 0, and liftoff of the Delta II rocket with Kepler on a search for planets in some way like our own. It really jumps off the pad. If you've seen the shuttle launch, it comes down really slowly and longer. This thing just popped right up. It's a very powerful rocket and a very light payload. You can see the solid wheel guys there. That's most of the light. One seconds another flight. Thirty seconds. It's always astonishing to me how quickly these things get out. Recovering from the initial launch transients. Passing thirty-four seconds. Mach one. Vehicle now going supersonic. Thirty-four seconds. Zero is the speed of sound. In thirty-four. Seconds. Motor uh, chamber pressure <coughs> is uh, beginning to trail off as we're passing forty-five seconds. We were six miles away, so it took 30 seconds for the launch sound to get to us. Symmetrical burn on the uh, groundless column. 34 knowledge. seconds to get to Coming up 55 seconds. seconds. Standing by for burnout. So the, the solid rocket boosters are going to burn out. Burning out of the solids. And then they just get tossed away. Did you hear the sounding boom? Uh, it came at about the same time as the uh, first sound from the rocket. And we have ignition of the airlift solid motors. So the solids have dropped off, solid, solid motors building and now the, the last two were ignited in the air. And it continued this way for another minute before the cutoff of the first A minute, 22 seconds into the flight. Delta two vehicle now only weighs about one half of what it did at launch a minute and 28 seconds ago, losing propellant at the rate of about 2,200 pounds per second. Could you see it when the rockets, when the boosters yes. fell off? Yes, we saw that. Uh, it looked like uh, sparklers in, on the point. Velocity 3,393 miles per hour. So in about two minutes it ended up, it, it was going 3,500 miles 48 seconds. Airlift motor chamber pressure is beginning to drop. Now the last two are going to flop away, so you'll see those sparks come up again. About the 10 seconds more before we burn out those airlift solids. And we have separation. Airlift set separated. Now this this lasted another three minutes. Uh, at the end of this sequence, we could still see it. It was 700 miles away. Uh, I'm sorry, 700. Yeah, about 700 miles away. And when this stage finally turned off, we saw it turn off. <laughs> it was just extraordinary. It was moving 17,000 miles an hour at that time. Uh, nearly orbital velocity uh, within five minutes after launch. And since it's a night launch, you could see it at that large distance. A, day, a daytime launch, you wouldn't see that at all. Uh, it was a very exciting, very exciting event. Uh, once the, that, that engine kicked off, there was nothing else to see, so we all got on the bus and went back. Uh, at about that time, though, Bill Baruki's two granddaughters, maybe eight or ten years old, came running up to him and said, Congratulations, Grandpa. That's the sweetest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> that was the only time he showed any real emotion. He was excited, you could tell, but uh, that was the only time that he had showed. Anyhow, this is the view from, from where I was watching it. it. These days, nobody watches anything like this without holding a camera up. <laughs> See, almost everybody, I, I, I too was doing that. <laughs> uh, Again, some spectacular images from Vancouver. This is a time exposure of the launch from, from ignition through the cutoff of the engine. Just an amazing, amazing thought. So, launchphotography.com. All right, so 
finishing up. This is the science team. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> All right, it's going to get bright again. <laughs> there we are. Okay. The science team for the Kepler mission as a whole is an international collaboration. Not quite as many countries involved in, in this, this part of it as, as within the individual science programs. But the key guy, again, is Bill Baruchi, uh, who's responsible. Without Bill, we wouldn't be doing any of this. Uh, summary, Kepler mission will observe more than 170,000 stars continuously for three and a half to hopefully as long as six years. Uh, and it will be finding, we expect, Earth-like planets. And the only question is how many? Uh, will it find as many as we expect if almost all stars have Earth-like planets? Or will it find very few? Uh, this, the overwhelming scientific sort of guess is that we'll find lots. We just don't know. Uh, we'll find out, and I'll let you know in about four years from now. Uh, and again, the key point is a null result would be very significant. Statistically, a null result would be a very important result because it would tell us that the Earth is indeed quite a rare place. Uh, we are going to get the first science data uh, the week before Ragbri, <laughs> uh, which is really disappointing to me because I'll be on Ragbri and the team I'm running will have to be there for a week. Uh, but the first planets to be found by, by Kepler will, will be after the three-month data release, which is in October. So look for lots of press releases in October finding their uh, like planets around, around the sun. And then this was an event that happened just uh, two or three days ago, a very important event. Uh, after launch for about a month, they do tests on the photometer in dark conditions, taking dark frames, as you would with a normal CCD. And on April 7th, the mechanism to eject the lens cap worked, wow. which is a very fortunate thing. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, we'd be looking for light planets around the lens cap. <laughs> uh, they melted a wire, sort of like the same kind of wire that uh, you use as an igniter in SD's rockets, which then released the spring mechanism and flipped it away safely from the spacecraft. So, uh, we're finally doing it. Uh, this is the kind of thing that, that human beings have been wondering for a very long time. And in case you didn't realize that, this is a 13th century book from Peng Lu. How unreasonable it would be to suppose that besides the Earth and sky which we can see, there are no other skies and no other Earths. Uh, Peng Lu couldn't do much about it. Didn't he? And, by the way, <laughs> So. Uh, well, this mission answers at least one big question. Are there other planets like ours in the universe? So. <laughs> the New Yorker strikes again. Uh, thank That's you all good. for your attention. I